Church, I have a confession to make. Something that I need to own. Something I need to bring into the light. Something I need to make you aware of. Now, we've gotten to know each other a little bit over this last decade, so I, I feel comfortable kind of bearing my soul to you. There's a program on TV that I shouldn't like, but I kind of do. It's the kind of program that others in the house would have on, but I would maybe, you know, peer over the top of my iPad. Yeah, you know, I'd be sitting on the sofa just busying myself about whatever nonsense is on my iPad, and you know, that kind of way where the eye would just come up and over, just that little bit, just kind of having that little kind of look. I'm, I'm, I'm not watching, but I'm watching that watch, not watch moment, you know, and I would find myself just beginning to make a comment Offering thoughts, opinions, the wealth and the wisdom of my experience. For it is shallow, if nothing else. But I began to understand that I was liking this maybe a little bit too much. Now, why don't you put it in the chat bar if you're watching on home what program you think it is? In here, what do you... No, no, we'll not have that. We'll not have that. I found... <laughs> I find myself actually enjoying the Great British Sewing Bee. <laughs> now, I don't know what's going to the cutting dash of, my, uh, of my, my clothes and my attire. I don't know whether it's because there's a, um, some latent creative in me that has struggled to come out through my being left-handed and, and all the, the hurt and shame that I've had to endure as being a left-handed person, a right-handed person's world. Do you know I went into a left-handed shop once? No, seriously, straight, straight up. It's full of things for left-handed people. I bought nothing. <laughs> Just on principle. <laughs> the Great British Sewing Bee, for those of you who don't know, it's a clothes creation competition where people would create, they would upcycle old garments, they would transform them into a different item, and they would also manufacture um, their what we call a, sh a showstopper, the final piece that they would create from scratch, their pièce de résistance, their crowning moment, their look what I have done, all the creative genius in me just beginning to pour out. And they would, um, they would get their pattern out, they would lay it out on, on the, the desk or on the floor. They would cut their material around about it, and then they begin to stitch. They begin to, uh, to sew and create this marvelous item that a model had to wear, and then they'd have to strut down the catwalk doing their, doing their thing. This pattern, this pre-arranged instruction, enabled them to create something wonderful. Well, maybe wonderful. Or maybe in different states of wonder. Maybe it's wonderful or maybe you're wondering what it is or what it's going to be. You know, as a, as a boy growing up, I remember my mum going through a phase, I think most folks did in the early 70s into the 80s, um, where she went to night school to learn how to make clothes. And, you know, in a particular shop in our town, Remnant Kings, was a place where we were often dragged to as children, where we'd have to stand there and not knock the things over, the, the displays over, with, where she'd go and she'd buy these patterns, and then she'd make us these, I wish I could say wonderful. <laughs> I know, but she might, just in case she catches up, <laughs> these great clothes to wear. And as a twin, we would get the same item, but in different colors. You know, there was a blue outfit, and there was a brown outfit, there was a red outfit, and there was, no, no, um, but you know, you, you get that kind of idea. You know, this pattern, this, this template, this pre-created guide that had been thought about, that had been packaged up and sold, given to you in order to create something that was going to be beautiful and something that was going to be useful, but for it to work, there was something really important that needed to happen. Anybody guess what that is? You had to follow the instructions. You had to lay out the pattern. There was literally no shortcuts. See what I did there? Eh, cut out material. Eh, 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 eh. Okay, bear with us. It's going to get better. There was no guessing. There was no... I really shouldn't tell you this. I bought a couple of pairs of trousers the other day. Um, and, and with me being me... 
Um, they needed to be shortened. I took them to the shop to get them shortened. One was a pair of jeans, I was going to wear them today. But I'm not, because you thought my budgie had died with a pair of jeans that I've got back. <laughs> I'll maybe pass them to Arwen. <laughs> Because you know how he's always just, just, that, just that little bit. You know, I, and I don't know what's happened. Because the guy took a pin and pinned it for where it should be. And I don't know what's happened. But they're too short. They're kind of like, you know. They're, they're... <laughs> Next couple of weeks you're going to be looking. You're going to be just be checking, aren't you? Now there is a little bit of trendiness at the moment. Where folks are wearing those jeans that kind of come to their ankle. You know, and then they've got no socks on. And they kind of slip on shoes and stuff like that at the point. Whether this guy was trying to make me dead trendy. But, I don't, but I, somehow I don't think so. We've got to follow the instruction. We've got to follow the pattern. There can be no shortcuts. There can be no guessing as to what you think it might or might not look like. You know, woe betide anybody that came into our house when my mum had the pattern laid out in the living room floor. But she hadn't yet pinned on the pa- the, 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 you know, this, this paper pattern, this tracing paper pattern on, on the top of the material. Anybody who came in and just kind of, the big door opened, whoosh, a gust, and then all of a sudden, this thing that she'd been laying out for probably this pattern for the last half an hour, all of a sudden was kind of like, whoa, up in the air. There was two mighty rushings of wind, one of the door opening, the other of a hat. No, no, no. Different days. Different days. The pattern was a template that had to be followed. It had to be laid out properly. It had, there could be no shortcuts there. I want to say that the Romans chapter 12 invites each, in the New Testament, invites each and every one of us to live according to a new pattern. To live according to a new way. To stop living according to the old pattern. And to follow a new and a better pattern pattern. I wonder if you want to boot up your mobile devices, you want to turn your paper Bibles to Romans chapter 12. We were in it last week um, and we're going to be dwelling in in this Bible passage, this couple of verses um, this morning for us also. This is the Apostle Paul writing to encourage the church. In Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 says this, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. This is part two of the message that I started last week. You remember that I said um, during last week's message that I'd gone to look at these two verses as being one sermon and just began to see so many things there that I couldn't possibly, well, I could, but you'd have been there till about four or five o'clock last Sunday um, as I I went through it, which probably wasn't good for you and probably wouldn't have been good for me. Um, So I broke it down into, into two sections, looking in view of God's mercy last week. And if you didn't get a chance to listen to that or watch that, I would encourage you to go to Edinburgh Elam Live on YouTube um, so that you could catch up in that. And, and, and it's so important that we have this lens to look through, this elevated viewing platform of the mercy of God. We realize what God has done for us. We realize the initiative that God t- took for us in giving Jesus, sending Jesus to die on the cross for us. Then it transforms everything transforms the way we think, the way we act, the way we respond, the way we we do life, because it's in view of God's mercy. How we live for God, how we live amongst other people, those of faith and those of no faith. But if God is real, if God is the creator, if God knows everything about us and still loves us, isn't it worth considering that this God might have a plan for our lives? and a pattern for living. If Jesus came, as John chapter 10 and 10 says, to bring his life, and life in all of its abundance. If, as the apostle Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation, that the old is gone and that the new has come, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, isn't it worth checking out what God's plan for our life might be? 
If Father God could see before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5. And if he could declare over an entire nation from Jeremiah 29 and 11, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future, then don't you think it might just maybe be worth pondering what God's plan, a specific plan for our lives might be? There are some things that we need to do. Paul tells the church here that we need to become living sacrifices. We need to engage in spiritual acts of worship. We need to experience transformed living. We need to experience what it is for our mind to be renewed and to know and then to live out God's will. You could put it like this. We are to come to the altar. We are to call out in unsung worship. We're to conform not to the world's way and we're to champion the will of God in our life. And those are the four things that we're going to look at for this morning. That we're to come to the altar. Paul says that we're to be a living sacrifice. Now, as the original hearers and readers of this letter that Paul wrote, when they would have heard that living sacrifice, it would have got their heads scratching to say the least. How could something still alive be a sacrifice? How could a dead sacrifice be a living thing in whose body? Mine. In a culture that understood the cost involved in the death of an animal, in order to try and engage with the pagan gods of the, gods of the Roman pantheon, or as a sign of cleansing or of repentance before the living God, I'm sure there would have been a few head scratches. I'm sure there would have been a, a few kind of shoulder hunching, kind of like, well, I don't know. Maybe there would have been a few kind of faint nods and that kind of grunt and grumble of, hmm, yeah, yeah, I think I know what he's talking about, but I'm going to look as though I do with that. You know how it is, you know, some folks just go, hmm, yeah, yeah, don't ask me, yeah, yeah, yeah. As the words of Paul would have rung out around the atriums of some Roman villas where this letter was being initially read. It appears a gruesome mystery, an oxymoron of two opposites, but the teachings of Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 is to offer your body as a living sacrifice. Now remember our viewing platform, our elevated position where we can see all that's going on is in view of God's mercy. The lens of love towards, of God towards history. Because of the willingness of Jesus to die in the cross that we can view this action as achievable. And that's good news. Because of what Jesus has already accomplished for us, because we can see and we stand in the flow of God's mercy, and then there's a possibility that we might be able to offer our lives as living sacrifices. F.F. F. Bruce, in his commentary on Romans, notes that the word used for present your body, present, is the same word that would be used for yield, or I give up, or I tap out. It'd be the same thing that in a boxing contest for the white towel to be thrown in or in the, when the wrestlers are, are, are on the floor and they can't go over the pain anymore because of the, the arm lock or the way the leg and the ankle's being bent where they'd be tapping out. Same word as saying, I give up no more, stop. I surrender. They would present our bodies as living sacrifices. There is this notion, this idea of I yield to you, God. I give up God, I tap out God, you've got me, I can't get out of this situation and do you know what, you give up but you don't lose, you give up but you don't lose, because you give up and surrender your life to God and you're welcomed into the family of God, you get to know all the benefits and receive all the benefits of being welcomed into the family of God, of being forgiven your sin, having someone to help you guide you through your life according to God's pattern and God's best way. The assurance of when we die that we don't go to hell, separate and absent from God, but we get to spend forever and ever and ever with our heavenly Father. I tell you, that's good news. I wonder, have you yielded? Have you surrendered? Have you tapped out in your life yet before God? There's an opportunity today. See, Roman society was all about public appearance in the marketplace in the bathhouse, in the senate, but there was private excesses at parties behind closed doors. They would often involve people gorging themselves on food and then being sick. You know, there's stories and accounts of people getting big kind of like, um, um, ostrich feathers or peacock feathers, sticking them down their throat between meals. Sorry if, you, if you've not long had your breakfast and you're looking forward to your Sunday roast. 
in between courses. You know that way in Christmas when you're absolutely stuffed? You've had a nice soup to start off with, or maybe a wee uh, prong cocktail if you're so inclined. You know, and then you get your main course of your turkey dinner, and then, oh, you're, 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 you're full. You can't, you know, oh, I need to do, you know, it's like I need to do a bit of a, a, a food wiggle. <laughs> get that food down. So, look at this morning, let's get some food going now. <laughs> Hope you can still go. Well, in Roman society, they would have had more and more and more. They'd have filled themselves up. And then just when they thought, oh, I can't have any more, they would go and they'd stick a feather down their throat, make themselves gag and throw up. Oh, we're ready to go again. You think on that when you're having your dessert this afternoon. Often as they gorge themselves on food in these parties, they would... There would be an excess of wine and of alcohol. There would be descending into improper spiritual conduct. You see, that's the context, the backdrop that Paul writes to them. Because what you do to and what you do with your body matters to God. What you do to and with your body matters to God. Here are some things to consider in this present your body as a living sacrifice. To be intentional. When was the last time that you offered your body to God? The way you look. How you think about yourself. What you do with your body. What you put into your body. Who you allow to touch your body. Have you presented it to God as a living sacrifice? Lord, here's what I have. Lord, here's what I'm good at. Here's how I think. Lord, here's how I struggle. Lord, here's the things that are challenges for me. Lord, use me for your glory. Change me for your glory. Equip me to display your glory. Lord, what does the Bible say about that thing in your life, in your situation? Do we present our bodies to God as living sacrifices as those who have said, I surrender to you, Jesus? Do we present our bodies as those who've said, I tap out God? It's too difficult for me to live in this world without you, Jesus. Help me. Number one, be intentional about offering your body as a living sacrifice to God. Number two, track how you're doing and rejoice in the positive changes. Make it your goal to live a surrendered life, a holy life, a pure life. Not saying how close to the world can I get and still call myself a Christian, but how close to God can I be and still make his kingdom difference in the world that I live in today.